All right, so thank you, Mike, again so much for meeting up with me as the our second second interview. Uh, I think we got together like two years ago or something. Wow. Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a while. It's been a while. I think it was mid 2015 or end of 2015, so more than two years. And I just wanted to do this little follow up because I know uh, a lot of your projects that you were doing back then are now a reality. Um, uh, talking about the you know the podcast and what you're doing, what you're turning the podcast into. I, I'm really curious to hear more about that. But first, uh, where are you at with your with your hydroponics business and all the other things you're doing? Oh gosh, yeah, big update there. Um, so the hydro business, I actually had to pull the plug on that about nine months ago. Um, you can go and you can get the full story at evergrow.com if you want to see the system and all of that good stuff. But, uh, you know, it was about a year and a half into development. I'd put in personally over seven figures into, uh, into that. And we'd gotten a working prototype, which you'll see in that video, uh, which was great, but we still had a long way to go. And so when I called up the, uh, the, you know, the developers and, and the design team and the manufacturer and everything that we'd lined up. And I said, hey, how long is, you know, how long is this going to take and how much more money is this going to take to get us to a production ready state? Meaning we've done tooling, we've done a test run, we've done safety, we've built the shopping cart, the website design, set up distribution and all of that. And we were looking at at least another two and a half million dollars. So at that point, you know, I would have had to have raised money to, uh, to continue the project. And at the same time, a competitor who'd been in business seven or eight years, who was very well funded, they're, they're backed by Y Combinator. Um, you know, they've got 20, 30 employees and about 20, 30 million dollars in funding as well. Uh, came out with three new products within two months. And the big thing about Evergrow was that it, it grew 35 plants at a time, which was enough to really replace somebody's run to the produce section at their grocery store every month. Mm. And uh, the competing company is called Click and Grow. And until that point, they only had a little countertop system that grew three plants. So they weren't really considered a competitor in my mind. Well, that month they came out with systems that grew nine plants, 35 plants, and 51 plants. And not only that, but they were ready to ship for sale in a third the price of what we would have had to have sold ours for. Wow. So that was a really big, you know, unexpected uh, dilemma to find myself in. And at that point, I didn't feel right going out and raising money to launch a product that I thought was really second best in the, in the industry. And considering the fact that it was literally just me and some outsourced designers, I didn't even have a team yet either. Uh, so I ended up trying to figure out how to make the best of a bad situation mm. how can you potentially get back you know the million bucks that i'd put into this and create a win at the end of the day so i ended up calling the founder of click and grow matthias and had a few good conversations with him and i ended up investing six figures into their company during a bridge round that they had between their a and b mm -hmm. uh series and so uh that's the way that i went through it i ended up writing ever grow off as a, a loss, you know, from a tax perspective, pull the plug on it. And hopefully in the next five to seven years, click and grow will have an exit and I'll get my money back. Wow. So <laughs> that's the, that's how that ended up. Interesting. What, what would you say are some of the biggest lessons you learned from this? You know, uh, you're always going to pay a stupid tax whenever you attempt something new. And for me, I'd never developed any kind of physical product. I'd never developed a high technology product. Uh, I'd never had to manufacture anything. And I'd certainly never been in the, uh, in the hydroponic food uh, niche before. So all of that was new to me. And so the potential for my stupid tax was extremely high. And you're only going to, you're only going to mitigate that or try to reduce it in, in one of two ways, which is uh, you're either going to go, you know, educate yourself as much as you possibly can or you're going to go pay for, you know, that tax essentially in the form of hiring experts. And I hired a great design firm, one of the best in, in the country, but they'd never produced a, a product for growing food, right? So they had a high stupid tax to pay as well as we tried to figure out 
how do you develop an automated system that grows plants in your house, right? Mm. Um, so I would have brought on a full-time, uh, essentially hydroponic expert onto the team, and I would have brought the per, the design the design of the system in house because. Uh, paying for it on an outsourced basis to an industrial design firm instead of hiring my own design engineers, I probably ended up paying two to three times more than what I would have if I had hired those those folks internally. Um, so those were those were two of the biggest lessons I'd learned, and especially when it comes to physical manufacturing, you know, type of product, you want to try to scope out and spec as much of it on the front end as you possibly can. Uh, you know, for me, I was learning as I was going, and that was a really, really expensive exercise to go through. Yeah. Uh, when I when I'm like, okay, we need to do tooling, and I'm like, great, how much is that going to be? Fifty grand? They're like, no, about eight hundred thousand. And I was like, Ooh. shit. And you don't want to find that out when you're a year into this and seven figures down the drain already, right? So, um, seeking knowledge uh, in a more diligent way on the front end before just diving in with two feet and figuring it out as you go. Uh, in retrospect, would have been would have been ideal. Mm -hmm. Wow! Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I talk to a lot of people when when they invest in something that didn't work out. It's like they call it the same way you did the stupid tax, mm. <laughs> or it goes into my learning bank or something like that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, that's the only way you that's the only way you you figure out the puzzle of business and entrepreneurship. And the, the first time, you know, when I first got into internet marketing, it took me six years to figure it out. Um, so part of the process. Yeah, no, I, I think it's really, really valuable um, that even as far as you are in your career, you, you can still make mistakes and learn from them. And, you know, you just keep going. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Usually the numbers are just bigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome, man. So moving on to, to the, the self-made man, um, I've been listening to the podcast. Not, not Maybe not every, I haven't listened to every single interview, but I've listened to quite a few. Um, when, did you, when did you notice that it was turning into something bigger than you had predicted? And, and, and tell us a little more about where it's going now and what to expect. Yeah, well, so I started self -made, the Self Made Man podcast when I started Evergrow because I needed a way to stay in touch with my audience oh, while yeah. I was focused on developing that, right? And so I was like, well, podcast is a really great way to do that because I'm not the one having to come up with the content every week. So, <laughs> uh, so that's really why I started it. Uh, and it really kind of took on a life of its own and it turned into just this phenomenal way to deliver value to build relationships with the people that I was having on the show. Uh, you know, the opportunity to meet folks that I would never, ever, ever have had a chance to meet like Gene Simmons or Mike Rowe, you know, or Damon John or people like that has mm -hmm. just been amazing. And the feedback from the audience has been probably the best I've ever gotten out of anything that I've ever done. Uh, just, uh, you know, from uh, an appreciation standpoint and a, and a value standpoint. So, it's been a huge win in, in all of those categories. I think it's, you know, we're over two years into it now, two and a half years. Um, gosh, more than that. We started yeah. in 2015, 2015, so getting on three years now. Yeah. Um, and so after you know, I pulled the plug on Evergrow almost a, a, about a year ago now, I said, okay, well, this is definitely has momentum, and it's uh, more aligned with my my history as far as what I know how to do from a business model perspective. So the question then became, how do you make Self-Made Man into uh, the biggest brand that it can be in a way that's not dependent upon me? Because uh, my, my goal from a, a personal business standpoint over the last few years is to build a company that is not reliant on me being the guy, the face, the name, the expert, the guru anymore, right? Uh, Evergrow is my first attempt at that. Mm -hmm. And Self-Made Man is my next. Um, obviously, I think this will be much more successful. But, you know, that really is the, the goal for this business is to turn it into a brand and a company that has nothing to do with me. So the only role I'll have in it from a public facing standpoint, uh, moving forward, once, uh, you know, we launched this week, uh, the platform is uh, as the host of the podcast. And that's pretty much going to be it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so you know, the, the, uh, the business model we chose to pursue is along the lines of building essentially a platform, a learning platform that's similar to Creative Live or Skillshare or Udemy, 
meaning that we're building a platform to host lessons that we've recorded with other experts in different categories of personal development and business. And then we're charging a monthly membership for that, uh, you know, for that, uh, for that membership. And, uh, it's pretty awesome. We've built something that I'm, I'm really impressed by and that hasn't been done in at least our industry before. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was going to ask what, what would you say is the biggest, um, difference? Like what makes, what makes it special if you compare it to Skillshare or Udemy? Uh, those two platforms specifically allow anyone to create and, and post lessons on it. So the quality, there's a quality issue and there's a noise issue. So mm. if you go to Skillshare, they have like 16, 18,000 lessons. And if you type in something like blogging, you're going to get 50 different lessons from 50 people. And at that point, it's confusion, you know, that becomes an issue. It's like, which one do I invest my time into? Which of these people do I listen to? And so for us, we're doing all of our content uh, proprietary. We record it all in studio at different venues that we've rented here in Austin to add some diversity to the look and feel of the experience. Uh, we're bringing in the best people that we can to film a lesson on a specific topic to deliver a specific yeah, you know, skill set or piece of knowledge that will help people move forward essentially. So it's all filmed in 4K. It's all filmed in 360 VR. So in the next couple of years, if you have a VR set, you'll be able to literally sit in the audience and, wow. and, and watch the lesson that way. Um, so from a differentiation standpoint, that's the primary one is the quality of the content and the money we've put into that. And two, uh, the fact that none of those platforms specifically cater to entrepreneurs. You can find lessons on knitting if you want, right? Yeah. Uh, they'll take content on any topic uh, possible. And for us, we're very specifically niched to people who are business owners or who are into personal development and personal growth. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Who are some of the experts that we can expect to see? Um, gosh, you know, Tucker Max on how to write a best selling book. We've got Christine Hassler. We've got, oh uh, gosh, let me uh, actually let me pull up the page. We did a we did an amazing fitness uh, lesson with on it. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy Frizzella on how to scale a brand. We've nice. got Drew Canoli on health and fitness. We've got John Benson on copywriting. Ryan Levesque on choosing a niche. We've got Jordan Harbinger on networking. Cameron Harold, uh, Jason Hornung on Facebook advertising. Wow. Nick Onkin on Instagram photography. Ken McElroy on team building and real estate, Russell Brunson, um, Jay Papazon and Jeff Woods, Hal Elrod, um, and that's just the first yeah. the first set that we're launching with. Yeah. Wow, you got some really tough people there. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully, you know, that's the springboard, right? And pretty soon, yeah. we'll in the next year we'll we'll take it to the next level. Nice. Well, people, I mean, I I understand that you want to keep it super like top level. Will you at some point allow people to apply or somehow to be a part of it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and you know, we actually have a link to that at the bottom of the platform. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as far as star power goes, it's the same with our podcast. You know, you could ask, how do we book podcast guests? And there's really three categories. There's question one, are you one of the best in the world at, at what you teach? Uh, and is that topic relevant to our audience? That's a really big part of this. For me, my benchmark is whenever we do a podcast, I want 80% of our listeners uh, to find that, that topic relevant to them. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is, are you a great storyteller? Are you entertaining to listen to? And number three, do you have you know some kind of audience or following uh, and credibility that would bring credibility to the show essentially by having you on? So those are the three criteria that we look for, and someone has to have at least two. Right. So you don't have to be a superstar, but you have to be a great storyteller and an expert in your field. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, any of those any of those would be would be great. If someone has all three, then that's a grand slam, you know, in our book. So it's the same for the platform. You know, we'll have folks on there that you have never heard of, but they're mm -hmm. experts in in their field and they're great storytellers. So, well, yeah. All right. Great yeah. to hear. So I might apply at some point. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> awesome. Um, all right, so you, you guys are launching on February 20th and you're doing this big contest. Uh, I've already entered. I don't know if by the time oh, people... 
<laughs> by uh -huh. the time people listen to this, maybe they can still enter. I'm hoping to upload this today. Oh, uh, great. Yeah, yeah. it'll give folks a week, yeah. Yeah, so that'll, that'll give people another week to participate. And if not, guys, there will be a link below just for you to check out the platform. Uh, I have a couple of questions from my audience because I told people, hey, I'm interviewing Mike Diller. Cool. And a couple of people nice. brought in some questions. I have a question from Dean, and Dean is asking if the magnetic sponsoring techniques that you taught 10 years ago, 11 years ago, actually, um, are they still applicable today? And, and how would you recommend someone approach that, you know, if they're faced with the reality of today? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, more so than ever. And, you know, you could argue that Gary Vee's new book, Crushing It, is <laughs> proof right. of magnetic sponsoring strategies, right? It's no different than, than, uh, than what I said in that book 10 years ago. Um, so, yeah, I mean, of course, the book is really about attracting an audience to you by delivering value, right? By becoming a person of value to help other people and therefore attract an audience to you. And then it's also about advertising uh, through through paid advertising, essentially, um, by selling a product immediately to that audience as they come into your ecosystem so that you can recoup your ad costs and continue to advertise. And that's really what the book is about in a nutshell, is those two, uh, those two strategies. And yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know of any other way to build a successful business, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, well, for me, I, when I remember when I read the book the first time ten years ago, I, I actually I don't have the updated version yet. Oops, mm. um, but I remember I remember reading it, and one of the things I loved the most were, was when you were talking about the the alpha, you know, like having this alpha attitude instead of being a beta. Um, right. And there were some exercises in there, and I remember mm -hmm. I remember being all, oh my god, I don't dare do this. I think one of them was walking down the street and just doing uh, making eye contact with people. And yeah. for me, that was so intimidating at the time. Ten years ago, I couldn't have done that with strangers down the street. Um, <laughs> but I, I do believe yeah. that that's, that helps, right? Making eye contact with someone uh, and being uh, the one who does not look away first. Right. That's the that's the key. Everybody can make eye contact. The test is who who takes uh, that contact away first. Uh, and that's typically, you know, the person who is, you know, the most shy or, or least self-confident. And it's a hard thing to do. It takes a lot of confidence to make eye contact, especially with someone of the opposite sex and not break it first. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, a really interesting test to to give yourself today. Mm -hmm. for sure uh, yeah. yeah so if you're listening to this definitely go and do that <laughs> yeah yep, all yep. right i have another question from uh, melissa and she's asking me because uh she knows that you you were supporter of a uh, supporter of charity water and i remember mm -hmm. when you did a birthday uh, thing um she was she's asking she's curious why you picked uh, that specific charity over over others or what other causes do you support as well uh, well, you know, part of it is I met Scott Harrison, the founder on Necker Island three or four years ago. We went out there for a retreat and Scott was one of the guest speakers. And that was the first time I'd met him or heard of Charity Water. But I got to hear and see the whole story through his presentation and obviously get to hang out with him on Necker for three or four days. And so uh, yeah, that is, <laughs> it's hard not to get involved with the charity when you've when you've uh, had that kind of intimacy around it at that point, right? So, uh, but the second reason is Charity Water is at the cutting edge of technology and offerings in the charity space, meaning they're the first uh, one in the world to provide complete transparency, not only of where your money goes, but also the fact that 100% of every single dollar donated is deployed into the field in a completely trackable way. So they don't take a single penny of your donation and use it for their overhead costs. Uh, that is paid for by a group called The Well, which I've since become a member of, which is about 100, 150 people around the world mm. who donate a substantial amount of money every single year. Uh, almost six figures is the requirement per year that takes care of their overhead. Uh, and that way, everybody else who donates 100% of their money, including the merchant account fees, goes into the field, and then if you're going to donate to the construction of a well, 
you know, they keep you up to date on, on its development throughout the year. They send you photos, they send you the location on Google Maps where you can check it out. Um, and so for me, if I'm going to donate to something, I just want to know that the money is going to the intended purpose, uh, unlike the Red Cross or some of these essentially, f- I consider them fraudulent you know, uh, charity fronts that keep 90% of the money that's donated to them uh, for themselves and, and, you know, deploy 10%. So that's, uh, those are the primary reasons why I'm, I'm a big supporter of Charity Water. Yeah. Yeah, I made a donation as well, and, and they do exactly what you said. I got emails every once in a while with updates exactly where my money was going and what they were yeah. doing with it, and, and they sent me photos, everything you said. And mm-hmm. any other cause I've donated to, I've never gotten anything other than a thank you. Yeah. So that is incredibly valuable. Um, another question from the same, the same person. Um, she, she's curious about what you've learned, because you've interviewed, how many people have you interviewed so far for Self Made Men? Uh, I, I don't keep track, but one a week for <laughs> almost three years now. So probably 150 ish. Over a hundred. Yep. Yeah. Um, what have you learned? Like what has stuck with you? What lessons have you learned or, you know, from some of the people that you've interviewed or what, what have been your favorite lessons? It's hard. It's hard <laughs> to say. I don't have the best memory in the world. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not very good at remembering facts or statements or whatever it may be. Uh, you know, there's little little pieces of wisdom that I'll I'll mm. remember occasionally and, and pick right. up and and use that as a you know guidepost essentially in my decision making. But there's nothing that comes to mind where I was like, mm. and it's it's interesting. I think that's that's not a reflection of the value delivered. It's a reflection of the a head injury <laughs> I had a few years ago and in, in my shitty memory these days. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll um, take it. We'll take yeah. it as that, and note that you didn't. Of course, you learned something. Absolutely. Oh no, it's been it's been <laughs> phenomenal. I mean, in the moment when I'm listening to it, I'm like, wow, this is this is awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but as far as as being a catalog, you know, mentally having a catalog of everything that I've learned, it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have the capacity these days. Yeah, I know, I know for sure. It was yeah. just in case anybody popped up in your mind, and oh, uh, yeah, there was this one person. Um, <laughs> Another question we got here from uh, Johnny. He's asking, uh, what would you say has the most impact on, a, on your daily routine? Like what kind of habits do you have or, you know, what, what kind of habits do you think people need to change if they want to go from zero to yeah. seven figures? Hold on. I'll get something real quick. Yeah. Um, so the biggest thing that's made a, an impact over the last couple of months is, uh, these guys. Ah. So Bulletproof. the Bulletproof coffee, uh, boxes essentially, right? So I'm sure many of y'all have heard of Bulletproof yep. coffee and the benefits of it, uh, you know, especially when you drink it in the morning, it essentially becomes your breakfast. But I tried making it a couple of years ago when you had to do it by hand in the blender. And I was like, this is just a giant pain in the ass and I'm not going to do it every day. (laughs) So a couple of months ago, they came out with these and they started selling them at Whole Foods, which is essentially ready-made, you know, refrigerated boxes. So uh, this is my breakfast every morning and that's been phenomenal. So I just have one of those and I typically don't eat until like noon um, and feel great and have just the right amount of caffeine, just the right of, you know, uh, healthy fats. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so from a health perspective, that's been my new daily routine that's made uh, just a huge impact. So mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. And from a, from a business or mindset perspective, do you have any, any routine in the morning or anything, anything you do in your day that helps you? Yeah, the biggest, uh, you know, it's really simple, but the biggest uh, item that makes a difference is the night before I just use Evernote and essentially run my life off of a to-do list off Evernote. And the night before, just putting down the, the priorities that I have for the next day so that when I wake up and I come in front of the computer, I know what I'm going to need to accomplish that day. And if not, I'll get sucked into YouTube and social media. And before I know it, an hour will go by and I'm like, I haven't done anything productive yet. Um, but if I have that list, I immediately know what I need to get done today. And, uh, and it puts me on track, keeps me focused and and so it's really simple, but I, that's the difference to me between having an amazingly productive day and, and one that isn't. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Planning your day the night before and just, yeah. Yeah. Just a yeah, simple. Yeah, without a doubt. 
yeah, simplest on, on Evernote. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, um, thank you, Mike, so much again for, for your time. I don't know if you have any last words for the people listening, any, any last recommendation, anything you want to you share. <laughs> uh, gosh, you know, uh, just remember that this is a process. I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years now. Uh, it took me six years before I ever made a dime. And, you know, the key to success is to go master a skill set. Um, the first five years, I just tried to find things outside of myself that would make money for me, gimmicks, marketing schemes, whatever it may be. Uh, and then I realized that I needed to become more valuable to other people. And the only way to do that is to go master a skill set and to be able to offer your services or knowledge or expertise to others. Um, and that's really what changed everything for me. So if you're struggling right now, I would ask you, what have you mastered? And mm -hmm. I can tell you that the answer you give me back is probably going to be nothing. And there's your answer. That's really what you need to change. And once you change that, everything else will change as well. So mm -hmm. master of skill, mm -hmm. become more valuable in the marketplace. That's right. And that's the ticket. Go to, to selfmademan.com and figure yeah, out what great. you want to master. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me, Carolina. It's always great to, to catch up with you. And, and uh, it's been fun to watch your uh, your success as well the last couple of years. So. Thank you, Mike, so much. I look forward yeah. to meet you one day. Any any events, any live seminars or anything you're doing this year? Or are you speaking? Uh, you know, nothing right now. Mm -hmm. Nothing right now. Um, I typically find that Speaking for me is a, uh, <laughs> you know, it requires a lot of time and preparation for, you know, an hour of ROI. And the only time I'll do it is if a really, really good personal friend uh, like Ryan Moran's event last year is holding an event and they ask me to, to come speak, I'll go do that as a personal favor. But mm. um, yeah, so sorry, there's not, I don't think I have anything. <laughs> the charity, the annual charity water event every year uh, is something I'm, I make a, a priority and then maybe south by southwest uh here in austin since i'm already in town i'll go Man, i'll go check yeah. out some parts of that so never been to that but it's on my list yep cool very all cool right. thank you so much all right have you an bet. awesome Take day care. and talk to you I'll soon talk to you soon bye